Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. Hello. It's uh, nice to be here with you today. Um, so in my talk here, I just wanted to talk about uh, why the Xinjiang narratives matter so much to Western governments right now, uh, particularly the U.S. Um, and uh, a spoiler alert, it's not because they really care about the Muslims. But I, I want to talk about why this campaign has been so successful, though. As we know, Canadian Parliament recently voted on a motion to call what's going on in Xinjiang a genocide. It passed with overwhelming support, and I actually wanted to reach out to one of the MPs to find out a bit more about what went into the decision-making process. I reached out to 80 MPs who voted yes on the motion, including some on the subcommittee who, was, uh, who were even more active with pushing this uh, forward. I explained that I have a channel with over 100,000 subscribers, but every single one of them either ignored or refused the request. There was one single conservative MP from Perry Sound, Scott Atchison, who did agree. But as we approached the uh, agreed upon date, a few hours before the interview, uh, Scott's office abruptly canceled and said that they weren't interested in rescheduling. It, of course, at least to me, is quite apparent that they looked at my channel and found out that I might have a bit of a different take on the situation and my show might include questions that are uncomfortable to answer. But I wasn't actually looking for a confrontation. I genuinely wanted to understand how they were briefed and who was involved. I actually empathize with their desire to vote yes and don't really hold it against them personally. This is even despite the fact they are confident enough to use such a strong term to describe the situation in Xinjiang and prop up the idea of even boycotting the Beijing Olympics, yet seem to lack the confidence to engage with potentially difficult questions. One of the things I really wanted to figure out was if there was any concern that the U.S. government is putting so much money behind this narrative, funding overseas Uyghur groups millions of dollars and dedicating a lot of airtime towards it. And what this kind of effort usually means, we have a precedent for fake propaganda created to serve America's geopolitical interests, whether it be the weapons of mass destruction or fake incubator baby stories and a host of other fake human rights abuses or false flag operations. And they have very good reason to want to disrupt China and its relationships. China's economy is now set to overtake America sooner than expected. Resource-rich countries finally have a non-Western option for cooperative partnerships, China. And they're increasingly choosing that option, particularly in America's old stronghold of Latin America, countries who have suffered under the brutality of American government operations for a long time. Chinese telecommunication companies are offering new non-American options, which are, of course, being slandered as having back doors, according to the accusations of a country that has constantly wiretapped the phones of even allied countries. And there's an increasing risk that the renminbi will challenge the U.S. dollar's global hegemony. We can see that with the potential of the digital uh, renminbi and many other international settlements now being done in renminbi, effectively circumventing American sanctions, which are designed to strangle governments and kill its people. Add the context of Xinjiang being the site of Asia's largest oil deposits and the fact that it's a key doorway to China's Belt and Road Initiative and that it suffered from pre-existing Islamic terrorism problems, the question suddenly becomes, how could you possibly not expect America to take a special interest in Xinjiang and not because of human rights, knowing full well America's history? From what I've found about the uh, initiative in Canada so far on my own, and with the help of a group called the Canada Files, there wasn't any meaningful pushback on the narrative or concern about being used for America's geopolitical interests. On the contrary, one of the main contributors was from the Uyghur Rights Advocacy Project, a Canadian NGO set up with funds from the NED, National Endowment for Democracy, or an organization who Max Blumenthal had pointed out that had its president say that what the CIA used to do covertly, they now do through the NED. This is basically a front to overthrow and destabilize governments, and it has nothing to do with democracy. They'll be just fine with overthrowing a democratically elected leader with a dictator if it serves America's geopolitical and corporate interests well enough. Going back to the Canadian vote, with all this in mind, why would I empathize with the MPs who voted yes on this motion? Aside from a very careful weaponization of compassion, the personal and professional consequences of voting yes on this genocide motion and later finding out it was just another giant propaganda campaign are far less than the consequences of voting no and finding out later a genocide was really going on. So in the absence of enough information, it's clear how they would vote and the importance of having their voter base who have been propagandized into a strong position on the topic must see that their elected MP voted the correct way. I'm not going to get into the problematic nature of all of the evidence. I, I suspect Matt, uh, Max might uh, touch on that a little bit, but almost none of it stands up to even the most basic, logical, and critical questions, whether it be the ridiculous formulas used to make the multi-million estimates, 
uh, or the testimonies like that of Tersenay, a supposed concentration camp survivor who was propped up in a major way by CNN and BBC recently, and is someone who's on the third version of her story, wildly deviating from the first, and whose passport renewal date was oddly the only thing blurred out by the CNN report. Because it turns out it's a giant hole in the story that nobody's talking about. It would be odd enough if China would grant a passport to someone they're trying to genocide, but it would be even more odd that her passport was renewed during the time she said she was under arrest. So the need to blur that out becomes quite apparent now. But this obvious deceit and whole-filled narrative that doesn't remotely resemble honest journalism doesn't matter because people are also frightened out of asking questions. I want to give you a personal example of that. My father, who doesn't necessarily agree with all of my views, of course, and is naturally concerned for the Uyghurs, um, as I would be too in his position receiving the information that he is, and, and particularly because he's a, a professor of social work uh, specializing in anti-oppressive practices and has even written a book on the topic used by universities, he actually does empathize with my point that anytime America says they want to liberate a people's suspicion, at least in regard to the true intentions, is probably a healthy thing to have. In an academic theology form he contributes towards, he asked the question whether we should be concerned about the intentions behind the narrative and if it really is in the best interests of the Uyghur population or it's being used to satisfy some sort of a Western imperialistic agenda. His question was, how do we support the Uyghurs and how do we help them without being used as a tool? With this mild statement in, in mind, my father was labeled a genocide denier. Not even in a theology form full of academics was he allowed to ask a question uh, or to even question the intentions, even as a person who is concerned about what might be happening in Xinjiang. Now, take that one step further. Imagine someone who actually is skeptical of the whole narrative and are seeing these massive red flags. There's no room for them in society to talk about it. Consent is being manufactured, scaring people into a specific narrative. Not only did we not learn about the risks of fake weapons of mass destruction like stories being accepted by the masses, but we didn't learn from the problematic phrase used by George Bush during that time. You're either with us or you're against us. There's no room to question the narrative. You can't stand in the middle while trying to figure things out. Instead, now, we're expected to believe that a population in China that has been growing faster than the majority Han Chinese, in part because they weren't subject to the one-child policy, where they have 20,000 mosques built for them, where their script is written on all the national currency, something we don't even do for our indigenous populations in Canada, where the biggest star in China is a Uyghur woman who was recently signed on by uh, LV as their brand ambassador, where Uyghur kids can get into top universities easier than Han Chinese and have specific halal foods pre pre prepared for them in the canteen and prayer areas on campus. We're expected to believe that this population is being eradicated. It's a ridiculous statement, whether it be in a literal sense or even a cultural sense. I think it's safe to say from historical precedents, the fact that America recently pardoned a convicted soldier who shot a 14 year old boy through the head in Iraq, along with a number of other unarmed civilians, which barely made a blip in the news, the fact that, uh, and this person was, uh, this person was recently pardoned and, and released from his uh, life sentence, the fact that we're not looking at how to hold Australia accountable for events we have literal footage of, where the SAS soldiers jumping out of a helicopter shot an innocent farmer face down in his fields while who was holding his prayer beads, and the fact that the U.S. sanctioned not only the International Criminal Court members looking into U.S. war crimes in Afghanistan, but also their family members, this isn't really about human rights and a care for overseas Muslims. Hypocritical Western nations and problematic narratives aside, I want to talk about the risks that come from brainlessly swallowing and regurgitating this propaganda. 62% of Canadians now support a more hardline approach towards China. Americans have also been convinced that they need to be more aggressive with China. Consent has been manufactured for American warships to travel closer and closer to China's shores and to begin promoting a $27 billion plan, which is in an idea phase, to install a chain of missiles just outside of China's Nine Dash line. That's a pretty interesting one also because one of the biggest producers of anti-China propaganda was ASPI, a think tank funded by weapons manufacturers like Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Boeing, and more. They produce China threat stories, then they profit from China threat prevention, a bit of a conflict of interest to say the least. So now I'll be living here in Shenzhen with my kids, potentially surrounded by American weapons of mass destruction. And you don't have to imagine too hard what would happen if Cuba hosted missiles from an American rival. With this kind of massaging of uh, public opinion, uh, when this kind of massaging of public opinion and consent happens, followed by actions like this, it's time for all of us to worry. 
softening the public up for war may not be the explicit intention this time, but we're getting awfully close to a point where it takes one small spark or mistake to snowball into a war unlike anything the world has ever seen before. And as for the Uyghurs, the specific measures being taken, such as sanctioning projects made in Xinjiang by saying it's made with slave labor without any actual evidence, well, ironically, it will take away the livelihood of those Uyghurs. And it's created an interesting situation where I now see foreign China watchers complaining that Uyghurs need to travel out of province in order to find work, which is a kind of cultural genocide, they say, without any sense of irony that the West is compounding this problem all while the American companies involved in atrocities at Abu Ghraib not only haven't been sanctioned, but have been receiving new multi-billion dollar contracts from the American government. And oh, those weapons manufacturers I was speaking about, they are actually using exploitative prison labor in the US to make their parts. And this isn't even the most ironic thing about the narrative. Along with a campaign to shame international companies operating in Xinjiang, fearing them out of hiring Uyghur staff due to the unfounded claims of forced labor they might receive, I think the sanctions are designed to do exactly what sanctions are designed to do, which is to make ordinary people suffer, make them want to rise up against their government. When you combine that with the odd recent declassification of ETIM as a terrorist organization by the US, uh, a group responsible for the terrorist attacks in China that killed not only Han Chinese, but Uyghurs as well, it seems that America is on a pretty clear path to support terrorism in order to achieve its geopolitical interests, an activity they've long enjoyed. So to those people who don't even want to consider the facts in an unbiased manner, you are complacent with the same kind of propaganda we've seen over and over again, which we were supposed to learn from. You are potentially complacent with one of the largest, the world's largest supporters of terrorism, the CIA, and you're also complacent with helping line the pockets of the military industrial complex. You're also complacent with the actual attempts by the West to oppress the Uyghurs, and you're complacent for creating a world that's getting closer and closer to a war unlike we've ever seen before. So while I do say I empathize with the MPs blindly going along with this, I still want to finish by saying to a government that doesn't even allow one of its own citizens to question this troubling piece of legislation, there's very good reason for you to be ashamed of your conduct.